wish I could give you a really uh, good set of rules. From what I've found is that uh, a lot of times per machine, not even per machine, but like, like per particular type of um, printing, uh, not printing. So for like, like SLA, the tolerances are, I think, 50 microns, if not less than that, depending on how fine-tuned you've got it. And a lot of machines can be pushed, like, like the general tolerances on something would be, say, on an SLA, 50 microns for the default settings, and I, n I didn't try and do anything. But if I spent a couple hours, or like I've done it enough times now, like I, I know some other settings in there that like if you go and change the build parameters just slightly, all things that people have access to, you can like really refine that tolerance down to particular areas. Even orientation affects tolerancing too. Like maybe if I really want a tight tolerance on something, I have that, like if it's a, uh, say if it's this part for instance, if I really want that surface to be perfectly flat, like really super perfectly flat, maybe my print orientation is in such an orientation that that surface is a flat layer versus if I printed it at, like if we can just imagine the bottom of my screen is, is the like build plate and that's some crazy orientation, the tolerancy may not be very tight around that because it's at some, some funny angle and like I might not be super accurate, but if I was to make it so that, where is it? For instance, in some like perfectly nice orientation, I'm gonna actually rotate this 90 degrees. I guess I can't even type in 90. Directive rotate, rotate at 90 degrees. Maybe something like that might give me a tighter tolerance on the top and down, on the top and bottom surfaces. But uh, it basically, it depends on the part and it depends on the machine and, and orientation. It, uh, again, it depends on the machine. The best, I mean, what's the best I've ever gotten anything down to? I think the tightest tolerances I've ever got is maybe probably 30 microns, but I know most of the time, like measuring with calibers, it's perfect, and so it depends on what kind of level you're going down for, but I've definitely gotten stuff almost perfect. Like, basically the same thing as the CAD file. When you, when you like scan the object and delta map it later, it'll all show up within 30 microns. But that's with some fine tuning, I think, and it depends on the material itself as well. So like metals are, I don't, I don't have as much experience with metals, but they can be fine tuned as well. I know MJPs aren't as fine tunable as much because of, because of the overall system. I think SLA has the most process latitude in the being able to quickly change the laser power, to quickly change the infill spacing or something like that to bring your tolerances down. Um, there are currently, that's a good question. Uh, so they're currently like, we're getting better and better and not just we as 3D systems, but like we as an industry are getting better and better at flexible polymers. I know I've seen some fantastic ones at some trade shows that were, uh, Basically, they're still in the silicone-like category, and they're, but I mean, really, really good polymers. Like, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed. There's some companies that produce some polymers that are, like, I would be willing to, like, wear them on my shoes right now. And so there's definitely, I know we've got, um, what was ours? One of our SLS materials, which I'm drawing a blank on right now, is actually quite, I'll, I'll think of it in, like, five minutes. But uh, it's actually a, a pretty good polymer. It's not as much as an elastomeric as it is just squishy. I don't know the technical term. I'm again drawing a blank on that one. But, uh, oh man, that's gonna bother me. <laughs> but I know we've got, uh, there's other, other companies that do, uh, or like material companies, that I've seen them produce some like amazing photo, photopolymer elastomerics that are, but it's, it's sort of new. It's sort of like, I know when I first started, there wasn't really any, or the couple that there were, and this was only three years ago. Like there were some photopolymers out there that were elastomerics, but they weren't great. And they were like kind of gummy and you'd stretch them and they'd kind of like slowly sink back to where you wanted them to be, but that's not a, a material characteristic that I want of like a watch band or something. And in the three years that I've been working in this, in, like specifically with the 3D systems in this industry, I've seen huge improvements in that period of time. And that's now the, I think material science is the next big hot topic in sort of additive, additive manufacturing industry is like, how can you produce particularly a photopolymer that is like an elastomeric and fantastic. And so I've seen some. 
And I've seen some I would love to talk about more, but can't just, but they're really cool. They are, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the things I have seen. So they're coming. Oop, I'm gonna knock this thing off the desk again. Um, those aren't currently out yet to my knowledge. I know Autodesk is working on a few, or at least talking about working on some that would optimize or at least help designers move farther along into that system. I know, I think one of the sort of roadblocks is that a lot of the software companies or a lot of the, the hardware companies don't really want to give away the sort of secret sauce that allows like that you just learn from experience that's like, oh, like every time I do this it fails or like it, this is, works really well. So currently there's, there's like a, a movement to sort of like have some of these hardware companies kind of not open up, but like if you give me a little bit more information about your printers, I can now design a CAD package that will optimize or at least warn designers of like, hey, you've exceeded this limit or like maybe your 45 degree angle on a metal printer is is acceptable and maybe you can push it. Maybe you can get all the way to like 38 and a half, but you're in this funny category of like, it might fail, it might not, but it'd be nice to get a warning. I haven't seen any that I, that I use that are like specifically for optimizing for additive other than like the topology optimization or the generative design softwares, but nothing that is like, if you put this part in, it'll be like, this is best for MJP or this is best for SLS. I would love that but I don't, not that I know of. So that is actually also a really good and hot topic right now. No one really knows. There's currently a couple of different possible things going for uh, basically not trying to replace the STL, but people are trying to replace the STL right now. What will happen is eventually someone will come up with something that's markably better than the STL, and so that'll probably push the industry over it. But for instance, like I've seen a lot of people, and I've seen a lot of presentations on people complaining of the STLs and like, we need to slice in NURBS and, and all of that, because you get a cleaner line, of course. It's a mathematical curve versus a, a faceted series of things. The issue is, is that one, like a lot of the 3D printing industry, like for instance, Invisalign, produces 180,000 unique parts a day from meshes. And so they never touch a nerve surface. A lot of the medical industry never touches a nerve surface. And so there's not a big push to like create a new thing because the STL is acceptable for those things. Now I've seen that like the AMF formats got some really cool ones. I know there's some other ones like uh, voxel representation and FREP rep representations, which also do a really good job at that. And they're just not as widely accepted yet, but they are, there's some, I was talking with a, a company earlier this week about they slice directly in the CAD software. So you don't, you'll like design it in whatever you're designing it in and then slice directly out of that in and just send it to the printer. So you never have to worry about giant file sizes. It's like if you can design it on the computer and see it and it's a solid object. And I think in, in this one software, it's always a solid object. You don't even have a choice. Like it's, it's just always printable. That was the, uh, that's kind of where I personally think it's going is I think the, the FREP modeling is, is my, uh, my personal favorite as of right now because there's no limitation to complexity. Like if I wanted to do a 10 micron lattice structure in a one meter block, it would do it just fine where everything would die if I tried to do that. The complexity of like, like if you wanted to model, say this room in detail down to something to 10 microns to like the size of the carpet, this carpet alone would probably push softwares over the edge where like a lot of these new, like the FRET modelers can handle the carpet just fine. And so long as you never make it into an STL, you can actually slice it and send to the printers pretty well. It's the, the like, the STL is currently the, the roadblock, but no one's thought of something that's so notably better than the STL that it's caused the industry to shift over. Like the other, like the, the AMF is pretty good, and there's some other ones that I've seen that are like pretty good, but not good enough. Like it's not quite the, like, they're like the first electric cars. Like someone had done it, but we haven't had a Tesla yet. It's still the like, the Volt or whatever that like Honda electric car was in the 90s. Like there's the first couple of stabs at it, but very shortly here we'll get past it because I can now model stuff very easily that STLs can't handle anymore and slice like, for me to slice like a five gig file is ridiculous. For even just to generate a five gigabyte file is just a ridiculous demand of me asking the computer. And so like if I, if I could not have to generate a five gigabyte file and deal with that, it would be so much better. But there's not, particular like good one yet.
So I've seen, so I've seen a bunch of FDM printers that will like also have like a little thing that injects some solder. I think it's solder or something along those lines into the into the, the basically the printing process. I've also seen some some of my favorite ones are uh, basically like selectively metal plating parts to get those properties out of it. And so like say if you want like an integrated like maybe it's too hard to to like actually run wires through an object, but like if I could print that crazy object and then plate it and then run power through that the plating, that's another possibility. Or maybe a lot of these, uh, like recently those, uh, what are they called? Conductive inks are looking really promising for doing these things. Like maybe I don't even, I can maybe just print a part and just flow ink through that part. And then at the end, I just have like a, like a conductive vasculature system versus like actually trying to figure out how to like model all of that in and then have another machine come over and put a little bit of solder down every single layer, which is slowing the overall process down. Maybe it's like a secondary factor, but I've not seen a whole lot on that. I'm not, we haven't quite gotten there that, that far yet. That was like a, like daydreaming a little while ago was like, if there's conductive inks, it's ink, it's liquid, I could flow it through a part and then that same principle should apply and so, whether or not the resistance on those things is huge because I've just flooded it with whatever else the, the, the carrier for that conductive ink is, like it, it may be totally not a great idea, but I've not seen anyone do it yet, so it's totally a possibility and worth exploring. I've not seen any of the industrial sort of printing of electronic parts. I know there is some, but I'm not as familiar with it. Mm -hmm.